thank you for tuning in into our very first episode in our holiday special this December. Lorelai is in this episode. Lorelai got a little bit carried away chatting and we spoke for about an hour and a half. So we're gonna split this episode into four parts. And if you guys stay tuned, at the very end of the fourth part, there's gonna be a little surprise for you. Or you can cheat and we skip ahead, but Santa Claus is watching. Come on. Laura, thank you for coming on the podcast. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Alex, for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, why don't we do a little background on where you work, your consultation company? Maybe explain what you do. Like, I went through your summary and your mm -hmm. website and stuff, but I'm still a little confused, maybe because I'm not from the industry. So maybe you can explain it to me as if I was like 10 years old. Sounds good. So I'll start off what um, how I got into the mining industry, and that can, can clarify things sure. a little bit. So I started initially working in transportation, um, and I was working for a California solutions company. And they had this interesting telematics solution, um, what they use for primarily for transportation companies. And my job being in the Canadian market was to bring it into Canada and also into the mining industry. So we found that this, transpor just this transportation solution is what a lot of mining companies were, were looking for. And so that kind of sparked the idea that maybe there's a value in identifying other technologies in different sectors where you can't find within your own. So the mining service and supply sector, it's very particular because mining is a massive industry. It's not the easiest one to break into at all, but we're finding now that the industry is opening up its minds to collaborating with other, with other industries like energy and transportation and so on and so forth. So. After that job that I had, I started to work for some local companies in the Sudbury area. And then I thought, you know what, what I really love to do is I love identifying, I love creating opportunities for, for companies. So I really like business development. I'm not the best at the entire sales cycle. So from there, I started my own company and basically I help companies with growth and innovation strategic options. I help companies look at their particular market or ecosystem and say, okay, so where are the gaps? Where are there opportunities that no one has even looked at? Where are the potential for the new markets? How can we help our company be more creative? So there's a lot of research and development that goes into identifying, first of all, getting to know a company and then looking into their market. The second step would be positioning them to say, okay, so now how can we package these, this new value proposition that you can bring to your clients and to your industry? And the third step would be identifying strategic partnerships and how they can help you deliver this and so on and so forth. And the fourth is implementation. So I'm helping companies be very, very creative in how they're serving clients and their industry in a new, in a new way. So basically you put... Um you find solutions to problems, I guess, right? I do, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you maybe you introduce new ideas because you come from, you're, you didn't start in mining industry, so you're, you have a mindset from other type of industries, right? So you, maybe you can see things in different eyes than somebody who started from mining his whole life, right? I do, and actually I studied arts in university, so oh, yeah. I really somehow got into business. I never thought I would get into the mining industry even though I live in Sudbury. And in university, I loved studying poetry and film. And I th you're, you're exactly right because the perspective that I take is something from the, the liberal arts, basically. So when we were looking at poems in, in university in my English class, it would be poems from 100 years ago, 20 years, years ago. And it's like, okay, so what does the author mean that I have no idea who they are? I have to read up on them. This is in a completely different language. What are all the possible meanings that the, the author could mean in this particular line. So you have to really look at that and say, okay, so based on what I know, how do I relate this, this part as many different ways back to the poem? So with what I'm doing, I'm kind of taking that and saying, okay, so here's your product and your service, and what are all the new ideas and pathways that you can serve uh, this particular client? So yeah, it is a very different perspective and opening up new possibilities, new pathways of how clients can deliver their services. That's really interesting that you were saying that. Uh, do you think that side of being able to break down and writing helps you think better? Because there's classes that teach you how to process big problems or even just put your, your, your thoughts together and they teach you how to write down, how to mm -hmm. maybe have like a first draft and then go through it and 
uh, evaluate each sentence and keep adding to it. And that's that's problem problem solving, right? Not a lot of people get to learn that. So you think that actually does help you, I don't know, put ideas better, could develop them? I think it really has because you can be, there's no wrong answer when you're doing something like that. It's like, so what do you think this, this, this means? What does this mean to you? And it's from your perspective, right? So that whole process is something that I've been doing for years and it's not like mathematics, right, where you have a particular formula, but it, there, it is very particular to your type of thinking, and you're really developing that, that muscle more of thinking outside the box currently, and it's, you're, you're, you're always creating something, something new. And I do, I do find that in communication, it's, it's everything for sure. So if you can find a way to look at something completely differently, that can be applied to, to anything. And like you said, it is, it's problem solving. I don't want to keep quoting Dr. Peterson, but <laughs> he says that, um, and I'm going to butcher this quote, but that he keep, the way you problem solve or you think of problems is you create pathways in your mind and see where they lead and then mm-hmm. if they lead in death or if he says something something like that or just failure you end that path and you mm-hmm. keep doing those pathways in your mind but there's only a limitation there's a limitation on how many scenarios you can run in your mind at once and that's mm-hmm. why you're putting it down on paper and analyzing it that way that's why it's having like a couple like two different brains being able to run more scenarios and have more brain power so yeah I think you have Maybe your studies in that gave you a uh, heads, <laughs> heads up or like an advantage on other people. Then. But it's cool. Why did you take uh, art? In grade 12 in high school, I actually, that was the year I enjoyed English the most. And I was like, okay, so I'm, I feel like I really am getting good at, um, there, we were studying Othello and I was just finding that I'd, like it was really easy. I was getting to like, like a good... Um, flow of, of ideas and putting it into writing and I liked the whole process of first starting out really abstract and these big ideas and then putting it down on paper and then coming back to it and say okay no I don't like that idea this one yes it can express so I just really like the whole process um, of that and again we you can apply English or arts to to so many different areas we looked at certain music videos and right there's there's Shakespeare and then there are poems and then there's film and there's uh, songs and things like that. So it's really interesting that you can apply that the process to to a lot of a lot a lot of different things. So um, that's what really led me to say, okay, so I do want to pursue something in in English. And initially, when I gradu- when I was a, I, I thought I was going to graduate and be a pharmaceutical rep in Australia. That's initially what I wanted to do. And I somehow ended up in, in mining. I, and then after that, I uh, after school, I was selling credit cards in Northern Ontario from Perry Sound to Thunder Bay was my territory, and I sold credit cards with. Um, a team in Canadian Tire and then got really good at, at sales and I enjoyed really refining the process of building a relationship with someone that you you don't know. So as soon as that Canadian Tire person would walk in the door, we'd have a team of us and we'd have to approach them, get them to want to talk to us and then buy a credit card. So that also taught me a very specific um, process. Do you, have, do you follow a process when selling? Or is it more feelings, more guts, like you're, it's already in you, so you kind of know, like cues that you already read, and they're already like muscle memory, so, or is there a full-on process, like, okay, I know this is the step, and then I do this next, what, what's it like for you? Always, so I like that you said that, because it definitely is always feelings for me off the get-go, so I don't follow a process in from immediately meeting, meeting someone, and the biggest thing I think I've learned is to really be yourself because often when you're yourself, you have this certain, a certain level of conversation with, with someone, and then you can better use your intuition to really drive and take the um, conversation in whatever direction. And then from there, once you get a good rapport going, then you can kind of bring in the business and the sales process of that and say, okay, so what are you looking for? What are your, what are your challenges? And the, the first process is I really want to understand what the challenge is and how that, how that person thinks to be able to accurately put myself in their shoes and say, all right, so 
I am a business owner. This is my particular challenge. So what do I really want? And that, that's a whole process in really thinking from from their from their perspective and then it's just an assessment after that then it gets easier you have to ask the right questions and then a proposal comes from that but first and foremost I think it's mostly a feeling a feeling process for sure because so you're you think to... you need empathy though I think so I think um it's interesting in in business often people really want to have challenging and intellectual conversation because a lot of people come in and just pitch mm -hmm. off the get-go say this is they tr it's like you're trying to fit something like something circular into a square box you're trying to to make it fit you have to figure out how to mold your services right and that person if it's if it's a fit or not and it all and we're all people so it really depends some there are some days where if you catch someone on a bad day you have to be able to be receptive to that and not just out, like automatically try to sell them something so it's 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 a really people oriented business and there are so many people that are, are intuitive and it serves them really well other people that are really good at driving driving their their sales pitch so in, like uh, emotional IQ must be huge for salespeople then yes um, emotional intelligence um, there was a conference that I was just a part of called Mecca, so it's Mining Engagement Conference for Advancement, um, advancement and it's all around soft skill development. So emotional intelligence is that for sure. Um, and I think it's something that isn't as paid attention to. It's starting to be paid attention to more. Or these, these leadership programs are coming out and more so developing. How do you deal with day-to-day -day challenges within your, your workplace? Mental health is huge, for sure. And... People can be put through a lot of training courses, more like hard skills, like how to be an operator or using Microsoft Azure, things like that. But then, really developing you as as a um, as a person and having a better relationship with with yourself is huge. But you think you can teach that the emotional IQ? I think that's mm -hmm. in childhood. You you learn that in development, right? When if you're exposed to other people, you're exposed to other children mm -hmm. and how to socialize. I think that's just. It's a tough one. I'm sure you can get better at a small fraction, but you gotta be born with it, right? Not born, but like as an infant, you gotta be taught that, no? Yeah, well, I think there's there's a couple things there. So from age right, zero to five is when you learn mm -hmm. the most, is when you're conditioned, right? But if, you, if we just speak broadly, let's just say in personal development, the whole personal development space where you find teachers like Tony Robbins or Bob Proctor, um, you know, Eric, Eric Thomas is more so motivational, but if you just start listening and try to learn more on, it could be specifically uh, how to get yourself motivated every more every day. So we're kind of shifting the, the topic from emotional intelligence. Um, but I, I think before understanding someone else, you do really have to understand yourself and how you work and get a little better educated and get comfortable with, with who you are because then you can start gauging your own emotions and learning how to, whether it's calm yourself down in a bad situation at work and first being that, that friend to yourself before you can um, really step out and do that for someone else because it depends on your, on your mindset, right? If, if someone is looking for you for help but you're in a frantic state of mind, how helpful can you be mm -hmm. or how much can you give yourself to to that person? So I think I think um, it's there's there's a big process behind that and it's difficult because it's something where it's intangible. How do you measure your success on emotional intelligence? You know, it's not like going that you're get, get graded yeah. or anything like that. So it's something it's something completely different. But I think there's definitely been a lot of a lot of uh, progress on that and attention on it. Do you have a favorite poet? Um, I like so William Blake. He's kind of far out there, and he was he was British. Some of his poetry is really difficult to to understand, and it's more so it's very theological in in certain aspects. But he would be one of one of my favorites. Uh, for sure, my top one. Alan Watts isn't isn't a poet, but he's quite an interesting visionary. I don't know if you've heard of him before. Have you? Um, no. He's in he's in Western, more focused on the Western uh, philosophy, and was also British 
as well, but he's someone again who's who's smart and talks about the mind and and uh, consciousness and so on. So those are my those are my my top two. Um, but yeah, I haven't been much into poetry as I as I used to be. It's more so business, but. I would say every day that I'm listening to to something creative, whether it's an audiobook or or reading reading something new. And another piece, and there's there's a book called the The Tao Te Ching. That's something where it was written, I think, I don't know how many thousands of, of years ago, but it's um, traditional Chinese wisdom, I believe. So it has that's something where you have to carefully dissect and really take your time in reading reading each each portion of that book. Mm-hmm. No, it sounds familiar, but maybe not. I don't know. Um, okay, then how did you find? Because you have a, a partner, right, in your in your business. So I'll explain. How did you find together? Yeah, so I will like, explain the company structure. It's 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 interesting. So I'm I'm working on building my value network. So there's a lot of specialized knowledge in the marketplace now than ever. So I've identified some collaborative partners, mm-hmm. and this is Jose and Troy and and Karen. So they are all to have their own business, and but we're working together because there are a lot of good synergies with us. So on certain projects, um, they're they're factored in. Troy is really good at at positioning and marketing side of things. Karen is really good at sustainability and focusing on really the mining client side. And, and Jose is actually my my mentor and he's in California. Karen is in Saskatchewan. Troy is around the world. So we're all come together as, as a team. And I'm also working my client uh, semi. I'm working with Charles. So he is a client, but as well, as a business partner. So that is how I'm growing my company because for me, it doesn't make sense to start hiring people. It, it makes sense to start, let's let's tap into the specialized knowledge that's already out there mm-hmm. and all work together. So I think that's really interesting because it opens up a new collaborative model for businesses and now more than ever. And if you, it's really a good characteristic or trait to start being collaborative as much as, much as you can. Yeah, it's fascinating because you don't limit yourself to just having who you can hire at the moment, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I find now noticing a trend that ideas are becoming the biggest resource. And if you look at companies like like EY, there are so many companies that have incubators. It's people are selling their insights or we're looking for new ideas. I've heard that a lot. We're just looking for someone to bring us new ideas. So that's... That's really interesting because now you have companies that have um, what they have to do is find how can I best hook up to universities? How can I get the most ideas and how do I distribute them to to my clients? So ideas is now becoming a huge resource. And again, with with collaboration, you have to find a way to identify these ideas or identify these key partnerships and then factor them into your business and how they can serve your your clients. Has the mining industry changed much? In the, or do you see like a big problems that are still sticking around that you would think it was, you could it, help fix? It, it has changed a lot for sure. I was having this conversation with um, a gentleman from Glencore yesterday saying that Mining, there are, he was, he was saying there, there are some TV shows that show mining decades ago and people, so there's, there's a lot of media showing mining from how it was in the past or these, there are, there's, there's a lot of negative media around mining, um, but it, it really is a, a leading edge industry and it, there's, we were talking about space, space mining now and asteroid, asteroid mm-hmm. mining, yeah. things, things like that. Deep sea is, is another one that's just, that, that's coming up um, within the next, let's say, five years. There could be a, a producing deep sea, deep sea mine, and it's it's an essential industry. A lot of people don't realize that. You know, it's in batteries, it's in your laptop, it's in phones. Everything metal is used for 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 so much, right? So it's very essential. But mining is it's a smaller industry because there's a limited amount of resources. So there only can be a limited amount of mining companies. So it's massive, but it's small in terms of who you know, and 
there's there's so much improvement to be done of course like like any industry but it has changed a lot we're really really it's it was it's a very conservative and traditional industry but it's really opening up it's 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 mine to um collaboration and at least some of the highest innovations in in the world and in, in mine industry um there's one mine in Bulgaria, Dundee Precious Metals. They have one of the most advanced mines in the world, but it has definitely changed a lot from bringing autonomous vehicles underground, all electric mines, and there's a lot of exciting things on the horizon. Yeah, I was... To my window. It's the okay. camera is showing at the gradual warning. Okay, okay, it's fine. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, I was... <laughs> I heard about the all electric mine, I started thinking, Well, that changes a lot of health risks, right? Mm -hmm. No fumes. I'm sure a lot of people still believe like, oh no, you might get black lung working from <laughs> in a mine, right? But like, it's all electrical. So you get that kind of stuff. You, you start lowering risk. It's changing a lot of, uh, probably they have really bad marketing because people should know this stuff, right? Yeah. And maybe my question is, what do you think, no, what do you see? Is it more, a couple big companies fighting for the resources or many small ones just trying to outcompete each other? Well, like, I would I would say that that it's both. There are there are a lot of major uh, mining companies um, and it's interesting. So mining is a mining companies are competitive, but they're not at the same time because everyone has their resource, the finite resource. So if you mine it, and if you mine it incorrectly, that money is lost forever. Um, So there, there's, there's always new, new developments happening. There are junior companies, which there are a ton of in uh, Vancouver, and they're primarily involved in, in exploration. So it's, it's competitive, but because it's a commodity market, whatever the, the prices on the commodities mm -hmm. is set for the mining companies. So to answer your question, we're... We're starting to see some collaborations, some mergers and acquisitions of larger companies, which is always happening. Like Newmont Gold Corp is now a massive, massive uh, company as well. But um, it's it's competitive. You always really the the leading uh, reason for competition is like you, now we have to mine deeper. So the ore, because we're, we're mining the ore, obviously there are there are deposits that are much deeper and the the price of that might not change, like the, the value of the ore might not change if it's deeper, but the cost to get it is now changing. So how do we become more innovative? So every mm -hmm. mining company, whether you're a junior mine or a major mine, uh, you have to find a better way of mining that that finite resource. So it's, it's quite interesting and Again, you don't have a choice but to be more innovative and sometimes collaborative, whether that's with OEMs or, or other mining companies. But with mining, if you change, let's say, one process or bring in a new technology underground, um, you really have to understand that it's like a domino effect because it has to be like there's, there's so much health and safety around mining that if you come in and you want to have a new technology, it changes everything. So how would this affect maintenance? How would this affect health and safety? Um, you know, how, how would this affect the shift boss and da, 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 which some people don't realize it's not uh, a super easy plug and play industry, but we're getting better at that. And we have, uh, there is a test mine, North Canada has a test mine where you can test your equipment in their, in their underground, underground lab and everything. But Yeah, it's it's a very different industry for sure. 